together and serve the Lord this morning. I know last week was the last week of Maine summer. We had the holiday weekend, but this week things are kicking off, and so we're excited to come together. We had a great time of prayer this morning and coffee. Our kingdom kids are having a leader lunch today, and we have communion. We have a great service this morning, and so we're looking forward to that. And we want to start our service by singing, I'll Fly Away. Aren't you looking forward to that day when you're going to fly away to glory? Let's stand together and sing this song. service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we rejoice in all that you are doing in the lives of your people. And we just pray right now for those that are hurting, for those that are facing sorrow, who aren't uh, seeing the hope maybe in their situation. I pray that you would help them to recognize that the only hope is in you and that they would come to you, that they would recognize their need for you this morning. And Father, we think of those that are sick. We pray for Jim as he's not able to be with us this morning as he's sick. We pray for little Mercy as she's been undergoing some difficulty with her stomach. We pray for Betty Ann Bishop, one of our uh, vice president of the Bible College. His wife has COVID, and we just ask that you would touch her right now and that you would uh, remove any symptoms, any problems from her body, and that she would be restored to complete health. And Father, we pray especially this morning for Doreen Cameron, whose, sister pa whose brother passed away this week, and we just ask uh, for your comfort to be upon her. We ask for the family, God, that they would recognize that uh, we do need to be ready for that day when we will be called home. Lord, as Christians, we look forward to that. We rejoice that we will fly away. We rejoice that we will be with you. But Father, for those that, are, that don't know you, God, we pray that this would cause them to think about eternity, to recognize their need for you, because that is where there's true life. And so we, we ask for your touch upon each one of them, that you would open blinded eyes and that you would cause them to see and come to faith. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Why don't you have a seat this morning? And we are looking forward to having a time of communion. And so I'm going to let those that are online, you can be prepared for that. We are going to sing the song, Behold the King, the one who died on the cross for us, who took our place. And as we do, the ushers are coming to prepare for communion. And uh, let's prepare our hearts. For communion here at Northwest Pentecostal, we welcome all of you to participate with us, whether this is your church or you're visiting. Uh, as long as you know Jesus as your Savior, you can partake of communion with us. We all receive the emblems and hold them to partake together. And as the ushers are preparing, let's sing this song and just check our hearts and make sure that our hearts are right and that we do rejoice in the one who died for us.
you paid the price for our sin, that we deserve death and, and damnation, but God, you were willing to send your one and only begotten son, that Jesus was willing to die in our place and take our sin upon him. God, I pray this morning that we would give our burdens, give our sins to him, that we would confess before him what we have done and that we would confess him as Lord and recognize our need for him this morning. And Father, that as we partake of communion, we would check our hearts and make sure that our hearts are right with you. In your precious name we pray, amen. Amen. I Just a sound check, make sure that our, my mic is on. Um, praise the Lord. It is so good to be together. This is a holy time when we gather together and we focus our hearts, our minds on what Jesus Christ has done for us. I want you to know that Jesus is here to heal. He's here to deliver. He's here, here to set us free from anything that would bind us. He's here to forgive. He's here to lead, to guide, to pour out wisdom. He's here to give us strength, to give us guidance uh, and power to live for him. And that's one of the, the awesome things about communion is we center on Jesus, what he's done for us, and it makes all the difference in the world. Just think, God is for you. Amen. Isn't that awesome? There may, you may feel like you have lots of enemies, but guess what? God is for you. And so, do you need help? Do you need grace? Do you need, you know, a character and a heart change? He's there in the business to do that, to help. And I think it's just so awesome. He's not the one that accuses us. He's not the one to bring charges against us. He's the one that vindicates us, that gives us his righteousness, that makes us his people, his holy people. It's pretty awesome. So when we focus on Jesus, know that he has everything we need. So let's read our text this morning, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betray betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, we have been going on in 1 Corinthians to look at what Paul's teaching us about communion. And so last time we read verses 27 and 28. Today we're going to read 28 and 29. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And this is not optional. This is, Paul says, we need to do this each and every time. You're never to take this as if it's just a cup of grape juice. You're never to think that this is something that is light. We need to remember what Jesus has done for us, that he gave his life for us, and what difference does that make in our lives. And then he says in verse 29, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. We need to examine our hearts, but also, not only do we need to make sure we're right with God, that's first. I do want you to know, I don't believe there's anything more important in our lives to make sure you're right with the God of the universe, the creator, the, the, also the savior of the world. You need to make sure that you're right with Christ, for sure. But he also says that if you do not discern the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking judgment on yourselves. And the body of Christ is very clearly, more clearly in 1 Corinthians than anywhere else, the body of Christ is the people of God. It's the church of the living God, the place where God has chosen to put his spirit, to put his presence in, to dwell among. It's pretty awesome. Are you right with your brothers and sisters in Christ? If you've accepted Christ and right with him, the next question is, are you right with your brothers and sisters in Christ? And you know what? Again, there is grace for us. Just as he forgives our sins, he gives us grace for others to live with them, even though we have differences, even though we might think, you know, they don't always make the wise decisions, even though sometimes they rub us the wrong way. There's grace. 
and there's unity in the body of Christ. We never want to look down on another member of the body of Christ. We also never want to judge someone in the body of Christ as being out of the body. Jesus is the one who makes a person in, and it's by his blood. He's the Savior and Lord of every person who calls on his name. And so let's just take a moment, examine our hearts, and if there is, if you have someone against someone else, call on Jesus to help you. And as you take, then, as we partake together, recognize his grace is enough for us. So let's just examine our hearts for a moment before we partake together. So our text says, and we know that after Jesus had, had, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. This was the Passover meal. He took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together of the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you gave your life for us. But also in doing so, in giving us forgiveness, you brought us together as the body of Christ. So, Lord, we are not alone. We have you as our Lord. We have the Spirit within us. We have a Father who's looking after us. But we also have brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, Lord, let us, first of all, appreciate, love, and respect those that you've given us. Let us also look to help and care and support them. And then... It says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Heavenly Father, this is our source of strength, the place of standing, the blood of the covenant that you have poured out, which we have partaken of. And Lord, we thank you that even as we die to our old life, you give us life for the new. You give us resurrection life, the power of the Holy Spirit. You make us part of your body. You give us great hope for the future. And Lord, we can have certainty that we have peace with God because Jesus poured out his blood for us. We can have hope for tomorrow because of what you have done. So Lord, let us not be ashamed to come before you because you've done the work. And we receive it. Let us come boldly. Let us not be anxious about what's going on around us, but know that you hold us in the palm of your hand. We thank you, Lord, for how good you are and that you're coming back again. And we will proclaim the work of Jesus Christ today and forever. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So... More worship time. Here we go. And uh, just wanted to let you know, Kingdom Kids are already in. So any of the kids that are here, Kingdom Kids has already started. We are back in session. And after our service, our Kingdom Kids leaders are having a luncheon and a quick meeting. And uh, so those of you that are involved in that, you'll want to make sure you're up in the Kingdom Kids room after the service. Tuesday morning, we have ladies morning out Bible study at 945 in the fellowship hall. And I know they're having a great time together. And Wednesday night Bible study. We are still trying to do it online for those that aren't able to be here, but the focus is really in person in the fellowship hall. And uh, John just has an, a little camera on his laptop to do that. So Bible study Wednesday at 7 p.m. And the kids are upstairs and the youth are running as well. Uh, Thursday, this, this Thursday, we are going to be also having uh, WM. WM is going to be having um, a testimony and treat night. So ladies, if you can bring a treat and come prepared to share a testimony, uh, we will have a great time together. I know it has been about, I think, 20 months, almost two years since we've been able to meet together. 
and a lot has happened in our lives, and we want to hear about it. We want to share together and encourage each other in what God has been doing in our lives. And I know there's a few who've gone through COVID and had difficulties, and so just to be able to have a few testimonies and, and share in that would be lovely. And on Friday, the youth are meeting here at 6.30. They are going to the corn maze. It's $15, and uh, they'll be back here about 9.30. If $15 is too much, don't let that keep you away. Talk to Vincent or myself, and we want to make sure that you are able to attend if you're interested in attending. Uh, this morning, we had a great time of prayer in the sanctuary here at 1030, and coffee was on at 1015. So we encourage you, if you're able to come early, come for coffee in the fellowship hall, come for prayer, and uh, it's a great time to be able to spend in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning. Uh, at this time, we're going to call our ushers forward for our offering. Also, next Sunday, as the ushers are coming, next Sunday night, we are having a time of prayer. From 6 to 7 p.m., we will be in the fellowship hall. And so if you're able to join us, then that would be great. Let's just pray a blessing over our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give to you from all that you've blessed us with. I pray that you would uh, help us to be cheerful givers, help us to want to give to you because you've blessed us so greatly. And this is just a small way for us to show how much we love and appreciate you. In your precious name we pray, amen. God bless you as you give. stand together. We want to spend a few moments worshiping the Lord who's been so faithful to us, and he is our good, good father. So let's sing this song together. Just worship him.
holy God, we are so blessed to have you in our midst, that you care for us, that you love us. We give you praise, and Lord, let us understand that there is nothing more important than pleasing you, nothing more important than having you in our lives. And so we thank you, Lord, that that is the one constant, the one promise that never changes, is that you are with us. And so we thank you, Lord, we can have confidence. We can thank you that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We can have confidence, Lord, in the future, and we can have confidence in the present. And we thank you that you've taken care of our past. We have confidence, hope, life in you. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated uh, in the presence of the Lord. I, I do feel the presence of the Lord is very strong today, so if you need something from the Lord, ask him. If you need something from the Lord, lift up your hands. Um, and he is definitely here to meet our, our needs. We are in a series on 1 Timothy, um, and we're not, not we're coming to the end. We still have a few left. We're on 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 25. And I think it's been very helpful for us in terms of we want to be people that follow the word. We want to be people that submit to the principles that we see in God's word for leadership. And that's something that we see again and again, Paul, giving to to Timothy. And this particular passage is no different. I've titled the sermon of my message, actually, Imperfect Leadership. And I, start, I don't like the title, but how, how true it is, and this passage actually is, speaks of it. We, have, we do need to remember we have a leader over the church who is absolutely perfect. And that's not who I'm talking about here. Jesus Christ is perfect. His ways are always true. He's guiding his church. He's building his church. We can trust him completely, wholeheartedly. On the other hand, God has appointed even leaders, called leaders over his people. And every one of them, without exception, are imperfect. Right? I'm imperfect. Okay? Naomi is maybe a little more perfect than I am, but she's, imper she's imperfect too. Every person that has ever led the church, including Peter, onward, through all the apostles, they're all imperfect. Somehow, I tell you, isn't it awesome, actually, how God is able to do his work through imperfect people? And as the leadership is imperfect, so also are the people remain imperfect until Jesus completes the work, until Jesus takes us home, until he then also comes again. But he has principles. Paul is teaching Timothy, yes, the leadership is, imper is imperfect, but there are principles for us to live by and learn by so that we aren't led astray, so the church continues to be built, so it continues on into the future. And so it's because of passages like this that have actually helped and enabled the church to go on and in strength and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so let's read this passage together. 1 Timothy 5, 17 says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. Solemnly charge, uh, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in the spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. Verse 23, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Likewise, also deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. 
Timothy. Now, we need to understand in terms of context here, he was like a senior pastor or an overseeing, uh, an overseer of pastors in Ephesus. Actually, the churches at that time were generally very small in, in nature in terms of the gatherings. They were small house churches. They could have been anywhere from even five, eight, two, twenty, twenty-five. 25. Those would have been the average. You could have had some churches that would have been 120, 150, that kind of thing. Um, otherwise, they would have had to meet outdoors because just think who would have owned the big, large, you know, pavilions that were, you know, would have been made it possible to, for g- large gatherings. And churches did meet outside too. Um, you have the Sermon on the Mount, for example, where Jesus probably preaches to about somewhere around 20,000 people, 5,000 men and their, and their families. So it's, a, um, it's a, diff- a bit of a different context that we see there. Remember in terms of we can gather, and today we probably have somewhere around 100 people here. That would have been a very large church in that time. Um, but there was a problem with uh, there was a problem with false teaching at that time. And we see first, Tim- and I would say there's a problem with false teaching today as well. But we see in 1 Timothy 1, 3, and I remind you again, this really should overshadow the whole letter. The reason why he writes in verse 3 of chapter 1, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on, on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Now, they, he would have had to deal with these false doctrines. And we see him at times proclaiming the gospel, setting things right. Um, he doesn't go into incredible detail because he likely knew Timothy understood how to combat false teaching with the gospel. Romans, for example, very much sets out the nature of the gospel in much more fullness. Um, but The bigger job of dealing with false teaching is actually not as much the false teaching, but the false teachers. And not so much simply the false teaching, but what that effect has on people. So to reverse that, those effects. And so how do you deal with those who are preaching or teaching something that is not right? In fact, there's very few things that are more difficult than this this aspect. I mean, if somebody preaches something's wrong, I can preach a counter gospel or, or a counter message uh, in order to, to bring improvement, but there will also need to be a dealing with the person who is, who is preaching falsely. So um, because of these, these problems, some were being told to stop preaching altogether. And that is the same that goes today. If somebody is preaching falsely, one of the first ways that you need to to deal with that is, okay, until you can learn to preach properly and have a better understanding, we're going to ask you not to speak, not to preach. Um, And that's actually seems to be what he does with the women at that time in chapter 2. He says, I'm not permitting a woman to teach or have authority over a man. He's not saying that that is a rule for all women. We know that would run counter to what we see in the rest of the Bible concerning women in ministry. Um, There is, even as far back in the Old Testament, you have Deborah being a ruler and a prophetess over Israel. Okay, so just in terms of even just one note concerning that. But the women were uneducated until they can become educated, learn. Okay, Paul is saying, I'm not allowing you to, to preach and that sort of thing right now. So we looked at that in 1 Timothy 2. If you missed that message, I encourage you to go and have a look at it. But this was also happening with the men, false teaching. <laughs> okay, and this is, he couldn't just simply say, I'm not allowing the women to teach, and until the men can learn, I'm not allowing them to teach either. Who does that leave? There's nobody left. So the men, there are some that are good, and there's some that are not. And so that's the situation is you have to take each one, into account. You can't just simply have a blanket rule. And so in 1 Timothy 3, remember, we have Paul giving Timothy instructions for selecting new overseers and deacons. How do you make a selection? Those are incredible, um, you know, really a a resume of, of what a pastor and what servants in the church, leaders in the church should look like. What's interesting is they're not skill based resumes, they're all character based. 
And the reason for that is skills can be taught quite easily and learned, but character is something that needs to be forged. It's something that actually is not easy to, to get at all. And Bible college students can understand that. And it's a really, it's an awesome thing. We do put them, by the way, Bible college students, through some fire and testing. They do literally write tests still. They have to write papers and improve themselves. And they're also involved in, in ministry as they are here at our church. So now in 1 Timothy 5, Paul exhorts Timothy about his responsibility in dealing with elders, who along with the widows even, widows too, men and women, did have leadership roles in the church. Now you might say, well, I thought women weren't allowed to teach. That's not the only area of leadership in the church. Remember, the apostles say, were, said, we need to commit ourselves, we need to devote ourselves to preaching and to prayer to the word of God and prayer. And what are the widow's main responsibilities? Someone who prays to God night and day and understands that kind of responsibility, along with other tasks and services and, and, and so on. So um, the church, though, I, I, I want you to understand, the church in the first cent century was different than the church in our day for a number of reasons. We've looked at already um, one or two of these. But Timothy also had a, kind of an, an apostolic responsibility. We actually see him appointing leaders and overseeing the gospel being taught. It was his responsibility as handed down from, from Paul. Today, our churches have a more congregational leadership uh, structure where the pastors as well as the congregation have a responsibility to ensure the health of the church. At least in our denomination or our fellowship in the POC, they do. I know in other, in other denominations it can be a little different, sometimes a little stronger. Uh, I, you know, if you look at the Baptist denomination, for example, or the Lutheran denominations, they're much more top-down kind of idea in terms of their, is that right? No, not quite actually. The Lutheran denomination, I should say, is top-down more. The Baptist denomination is even stronger in terms of the people, the, the congregation having the say in who will lead and who will not. So, excuse me. So remember, I'm imperfect. Forgive my, my misspeaking there. Okay, anyway. Um, so here at NPA, for example, the pastors work with the board very closely to implement vision and programs in the church. And I'm so we are so blessed. Uh, two years of of being a part, have, of co-leading, to have just an incredible board. Every member has been so, uh, so awesome. And I want to know, I also, the testimony of Pastor Feller is, he's been blessed to have a great board all along. Um, and so I, wa I want you to know, I mean, it's, it's something that we are truly blessed with, to have people that support and come alongside of us. Now, by necessity, Timothy, at that time, carried much of this responsibility himself. And I think it's a blessing that today we're able to share it with, with the congregation. And you also have education. You also have understanding concern, concerning what is the role of the pastor and what should, they, what should they do and what should it look like. So today, the congregation, as well as the pastors, share responsibility for church leadership. So what Paul is saying to Timothy here in these verses is very much your responsibility as much as it is our responsibility too. In 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 25, God gives us three steps to ensure healthy leadership. Now, we're not going to, just a note here, we're not going to deal with them in the same order as the text because of the different context that we're dealing with. There was a dysfunction needing to be corrected in the church. At this time, I don't see a dysfunction in the church leadership structure or in the leaders that are in the church. I praise the Lord for that. That isn't always the case. It probably won't be always the case uh, for us in the future. We'll have to deal with issues because we are imperfect. But we're going to, be fo we're going to focus on maintaining then a healthy church. So the first step to ensure a healthy leadership is to establish leaders righteously. So we're going to start at verse 22, and in this section we're going to lo be looking at verses 22 through 25. But first, verse 22 says, Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily, and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. So you want someone who understands that we need to live righteously. We need to live apart from sin. 
what are the defining characteristics of any Christian is that we are at war with sin. We hate it. We cannot, we cannot leave it in ourselves. We cannot um, be, be at peace with a sinful lifestyle in ourselves. I'm saying that's for every Christian, but especially the leadership needs to understand this. Because if not, they're going to be leading others astray, and maybe many others astray. So, now just a, a note here on the, the laying on of hands. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily. This is not referring to, like, ushering them out of the church kind of thing. Lay hands on them and disciplining them or something. That's not what's happening. Um, it, it, it can be a little bit confusing if you don't know the biblical, really, the context here. Um, this was a way of affirming the place of leadership in the church, kind of like an ordination sort of service. And actually, it's something that we continue to practice today in an ordination service where pastors are being established or affirmed. Um, there will be the laying on of hands. And it's a way of showing acceptance, approval, respect, love, prayer, support for those, for the pastors. Okay, so the laying on of hands. First Timothy actually explains this in regards to Timothy's own kind of ordination service. It says in verse 14 of chapter 4, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Now the presbytery here is elders, or the elder, um, those who belong to, to the elders. Now, when we affirm leadership, um, when we affirm that leadership, what we're saying is we're responsible or share in their responsibility in terms of their ministry and their work among us. And so Paul is saying, be careful. So that were the, he says this actually in regard to overseers in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. He says, they are not to be a new convert. Okay, now in the Greek, we probably went over this, Naomi went over this a little bit when she went over this section, but that simply means not to be newly planted. Um, they're not to first, like, be Christians. And this can, when would this happen in terms of a leader, be, you know, being chosen from someone who, or a group who is um, newly saved, that kind of thing? It happens, actually, a fair amount, especially when they're, they're leaders before they became Christians, and now they're simply would like to be leaders now. Also, celebrities, this is a major problem for them. They, people look up to them before, they come into the church, and now it's like everybody wants to listen and hear from them. And so they need to be cautioned in some ways. Yes, share your testimony. Be careful about sharing your opinions because you haven't learned yet, and you could definitely lead people astray. So keeping free from sin, we need, Timothy was exhorted to do that, and this should be a characteristic of all leadership. Now, in terms of, Paul is going to actually critique a little bit of Paul's personal character or personal practice. And we see that in the next verse, 1 Timothy 5.23 says, No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Timothy was likely being ex influenced by extreme teaching here. Why would he not be drinking at all? And we might say, well, that's the best practice. We should all do that. And before you say, you know, amen, I, I agree with you. It is the best practice. But it wasn't necessarily the best practice at that time. So 1 Timothy 4, 3 says, Men who forbid marriage, now this is talking about fault, there's false teachers among you. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Now, wine at that time, as we see in our verse here, um, wine was widely recognized in the ancient world as having medicinal purposes, medicinal properties. And you could take a little bit of wine and actually add it to a whole lot of water, and there it would have a purifying effect. It's just actually, it's a scientific fact. Part of what alcohol does, actually, is kills bacteria and that sort of thing. And so cl getting clean water at that time could be very difficult. Imagine if that's all you had was that unclean, really impure water, and you could have very much a lot of digestive kind of problems. And by the way, the Jews, when they would typically, when they would drink wine, they would not, and, and they would have wine even at every meal, they would not drink full wine like what we have. It would be watered down. And so just to let, so you know, it was part of the culture, yes, 
but it also had even medicinal kind of purposes, especially at times. We want to make sure that we're not living by some kind of legalistic code, and we don't even know why we're doing it, but we think we should do it. And sometimes people will come in and say, you shouldn't do this. This happened in the past many times. You shouldn't, guys, you shouldn't wear ties. I don't know if you heard about this. Saying, guys, you shouldn't wear ties back in like the 70s, 60s, that kind of thing. Maybe even earlier, okay, uh, before I was born. But you shouldn't wear ties. And one of the reasons is, is because the tie points downward. No, I'm serious. Tie points downward. In some circles, this was being, being proclaimed. Why are you not wearing a tie? Well, well, do we wear ties today? We wear t- I'm not wearing one this morning, but we, we, we wear, there's nothing wrong with wearing ties. There's, there's fine. It's, it's neither here nor there. There were also, when I grew, was growing up, there was a lot of voices that were saying, like, you shouldn't watch TV at all. Get rid of your TVs. It was a really big thing. Well, why should we get rid of our TVs? Is it all bad? Same kind of thing could be said today. We should get rid of the Internet. There's so much garbage on the Internet, we shouldn't use it. There is a lot of garbage on the internet, let me be honest with you. And there's bad stuff on TV. But we need to be discerning, and we actually need to make choices that are, that are righteous and holy. And that doesn't mean total abstinence from everything, especially there's a lot of good stuff on TV, and there's a lot of good stuff on the internet. By the way, my blog, for example, I do a little devotional every day, is actually on the internet. Right? And our website is on the internet. So that right there proves the point, I think, in some ways. Um, but anyway, we don't want to be legalistic about things either. We need to know why we're doing what we're doing. Now, the, what Paul is telling Timothy is don't be legalist because people are going to be following you in this. Make sure you know what you're doing. 1 Timothy 5, 24 to 25 says, The sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Likewise, also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Now, this is, some, I think it's fairly self-explanatory here. Sometimes you look at a person and you can see the sins. You watch them just for a few minutes even. It's like, well, I can see. I, they had to take, you know, they're doing this or they're doing that. Their mouth is not really clean or holy or whatever, the way they're speaking. You can see it right away, you know. But there are others that you might think, man, that person is like, must be like the perfect Christian. Now, w- remember how we started off on the title of my message is imperfect leadership. We could say like imperfect people. That we're all imperfect. Know that if a person looks too good, they probably are. They are. They're not that good. Nobody is that good except Jesus. We all, all of us have issues that we're dealing with. You don't know what goes inside of my mind 24-7. I try. I'm doing, so, as I talked about last week, I'm so doing so much better than I, than I really, I think, ever have in my life. That doesn't mean I never have issues. I never, you know, have a, a ma- I never get angry at Naomi. That doesn't mean that. Of course I do sometimes, but I shouldn't. I get angry at my kids. I, I could lose my temper even and say things I shouldn't say. Isn't that true? But until you live with somebody, you might not know or see it, right? So we have to watch them. So in other words, we need the Holy Spirit to help us. And one of the gifts of the Spirit is discerning of spirits. Man looks on the outward It's God who looks on the heart. We really need help, and we need to understand when it comes to leaders, we need his help. And so we need need to be cautious when it comes to selecting new leaders in the sense of watching them. Um, We need prayer, and we need to heed God's guidance. And I think we've tried to practice that definitely in this church. So the first step to ensure a healthy leadership is to establish leaders righteously. The second step is to evaluate leaders impartially. So we're going to read all three verses that are part of this one. We're going back then to the middle section here. 1 Timothy 5, 19 to 21. Um, Evaluate leaders impartially. Verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, excuse me, except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Now, just before we start, oh, you know, like, look at what they're doing and 
I'm not looking actually for you to really critique every area and part of my life. Um, that would not be fun, really. It would make probably life fairly miserable. However, if you see it, an er, uh, something that I, is ongoing in my life, I do, you, first of all, you have a responsibility to do so, and I want you to tell me. I want you to come to me because you care and you love me. Now, how, what, what's the attitude we're supposed to have? First Timothy 5, 1 says, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father. Remember, we looked at that last time when dealing with leaders, we're to deal with them because we want to encourage them. We want to support them. And this goes, by the way, not just for men, but it goes for women. It goes for young men, and it goes for young women also, that we would show them respect. So leaders, though, are, th are to be thought of as part of the family. Um, and really, we should be treating each other with gentleness as well. Now, the idea of accusations, leaders often have to undergo them. Now, it has been really a pleasure overall for two years, and really the 20 years that I've been in ministry here at the church before that, it's been a blessing. Very few times have I received an, 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 like people negative really towards me or a negative attitude towards me. Um, but just so you know in terms of this isn't always the case, John Calvin, one of the early reformers, for example, he was a theo an incredible theologian um, and a pastor. He wrote, none are more exposed to slanders and insults than godly teachers. They may perform their duties correctly and conscientiously, yet they never avoid a thousand criticisms. And that is often the case. We're in the limelight. You can see us. You can watch us. We, you, you definitely could point out er areas where we're not, do we're not perfect, for sure. So that's not what Paul is trying to get at, though. He's trying to get at where there's areas of sin and where there's continual sinning. That's what we need to be especially concerned with, is if you see me in sin, it's, it's, if it comes to the surface and you see it, it's probably not just a one-time thing either. You may need, it would, pray about it, and if God leads you, come and talk to me about it. And I think that goes for all the leaders as well. We want to, um, we need your support and help. Again, doing it in a spirit of gentleness and helpfulness. Now, the idea of partiality is, as far as Timothy goes, who is he going to correct and who is he not? Often, as leaders, we can become very close, too. We're working together and, and spending a lot of time together. And then we can become almost like friends. And it can be much more difficult to correct or rebuke or do what discipline a friend, isn't it? And so that's why sometimes it's said pastors don't have very many friends. In fact, they can feel very much alone. Because we always have to keep in mind our calling. We always have to keep in mind the serious nature of, of the position that we even hold. And I tell you, it is, it is good. It's a noble profession. It, in many ways, I'm better for it. But at the same time, you can see how it could be, it could be tiring or wearying as well. It definitely isn't a nine-to-five job. Um, Jesus gives us instruction, actually, very close to what we see in these verses in Matthew 18, 15 to 20. But he's speaking of just Nate, sin in general. How do you deal with correcting others who are sinning? And he says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, Every fact may be confirmed. Do you see the, the similarity here? It's the same that pastors are to have. Are, are, you're only to accept an accusation against an elder on the basis of two or three witnesses. Now, just as uh, one note on this verse, this is what the Old Testament law said in regard to judgment, in regard to bringing somebody to trial. There needs to be at least two or three witnesses. Why? Because sometimes a person can have a personal grudge against someone else. Because there needs, to, and unfortunately that's the case, two or three, it makes it much more, well, first of all, it, it protects the pastor. It protects even each other that we would not be maligned maliciously um, and torn up, our lives torn apart. 
Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Sounds kind of harsh. Treat him as a tax collector and, a, and, a, and a, a, a Gentile and a tax collector. Remember, those are people who need to be saved. So it doesn't mean you ostracize them and never talk to them. It means that you would pray for them, that you encourage them in Christ, encourage them to, to repent also, and don't say that everything is okay with them. It's kind of a, a you know, again, you're concerned about their, their heart and their soul. So, verse 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. That's, those are really great verses, or is a great verse, but remember, it's in regard to bringing correction. If you bind someone, or there's the binding going on, what's that saying is, you're saying it's not forgiven because there's no repentance and they continue in sin. If you're loosing it, you're saying based on their confession and their change of behavior, they're forgiven. And that's an awesome thing that we have as being able to affirm forgiveness for other people. Verse 19, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that you may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Verse 20, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. There's nothing more important or more serious, more difficult, I should say, than in bringing correction to a fellow brother or sister in Christ. I know as a father, one of the hardest things that I have to do, and I... I'm pra- I praise the Lord, I v- rarely almost have to do it now, but is when I have to bring correction to my kids. It's hard. I don't like doing it, but I have to. It's, and God tells us, as part of the church, he's there with us. Isn't that an incredible promise? You have to bring correction. You're not standing by yourself. I'm there. And it's the same thing that he's talking to us about in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, is when he, he adjures him even, by and in the presence of God, that you show no partiality, treat people with respect, treat people right, but you do have to admonish them. You do have to bring correction where it's needed. And so we need to remember that the, like the same principles apply to a congregation as, as to a leader. Remember Paul's words in 1 Timothy 3.15. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. God is with us. This is God's community, God's people. And so recognize when you get together, this isn't just a social gathering. God is with us. All right. The first step to ensure a healthy leadership is to establish leaders righteously. The second step is to evaluate leaders impartially. And thirdly, esteem leaders appropriately. Now, 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18, our first couple of verses says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the labor is worthy of his wages. Now, first of all, I'm not going to speak a great deal or at all, really, about, about being paid. We're, we are paid well. We try, we want to pay w- as we can even the leaders that are under us. We have definitely believe in this. And I want to thank you also for, for the generous support and so on that you have. We feel, we do feel honored. But there's a few v- verses here, or uh, parts of this verse that can sometimes be overlooked. It's just simply get to the payment aspect. The first aspect there is elders who rule well. The elders who rule, what does that mean? That almost kind of you think of a king, perhaps, ruling and reigning. That's not what the Greek actually would imply. Um, Leaders in the church are not to rule. Better word for it is lead, probably, the elders who lead well. Some translations actually go that route. But leaders are not to rule by our authority primarily or by, like, our office or through power plays. And the reason why I bring this up is because this is the way the world leads, typically. You rule by your position. You rule because of the authority you have. You rule also whatever you... Whatever needs to happen to get something through, you do it. Whether you have to make backroom deals, you do stuff, you you collaborate and have a, um, you know, do things behind closed doors. It's not out in the open. 
in the church, things should be done openly. Remember, Jesus tells his disciples, what I have told you in private, proclaim to everyone, proclaim publicly. We're to do, we're not to have, oh, this is a secret. Don't let anyone know what's, what's happening here. Um, I don't think that like these not the uh, non-disclosure agreements and that kind of thing belong in the church. Now, there may be exceptions to that rule, but as a rule, it, it definitely um, should apply. So Luke 22, 25 to 27, Jesus tells the disciples how different leadership is supposed to be. And what's really interesting is he will go on to say, you will, you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to have a, an aspect of reigning and ruling, but this is what it looks like, he says. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. And then he, then he says, but it's not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? That's the way you would normally think, but he says, not that way in the kingdom of God. I am among you as the one who serves. Leaders in the church should first and foremost be examples of servants of Christ. We are called to submit to church leaders. We see that throughout Scripture. But this is given voluntarily, not by coercion, not forcefully. And as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. All Christians and Christian leaders should strive to follow Paul in this. You, I should be able to tell you, and I do, follow me as I follow Christ. You should be able to tell your friends, your co-workers, your family members, follow me as I follow Christ. Look at my life. It will make a difference in your life. Well, that's a high calling, isn't it? Just realize when Paul said that he was speaking to the Corinthians. But we got, Jesus calls us all to be his disciples and his light to the world. Now, it also goes on to talk in this passage. I know we're, we're just about out of time, but I just want to make note. It, it mentions the importance of preaching and teaching uh, here, that the, uh, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. The church is built on the gospel. Remember, we're the support and pillar of the truth. And so there will always be an, an important part, an important, a central role even of preaching, of teaching, discipleship in the church. And I would submit to you that pastors in Scripture are not simply leaders in the church, although they are that. They are those who feed, those who care for the flock. We're, we're sheep. We're like, we're lambs with you. But we're also, we have a calling to also feed you. And we feed you with the word of God. We have a sacred calling, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 1-2. I solemnly charge you, again, he, he does this when it's most important. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, what's he going to say? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, repro reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. There's a, a priority to preach the word. Pastors who are actually, just remember the word that is behind that is shepherds. They have a responsibility to give God's word to his people. And for us, that will mean being focused, being diligent in the word of God for ourselves, but also for you. And so I want, um, in terms of summing, summing this up, this is in order, to, um, in order to ensure a healthy leadership. We need to be about establishing leaders righteously. We need to evaluate leaders impartially, and we need to esteem leaders appropriately. Um, before we conclude, I want to present to you six, I'm excited actually, it's actually, it's thrilling for me. I never, two months ago, I probably never would have thought that this would have been the case. 
but I want to present to you six Vanguard College students who, are participate, who we are participating in in terms of their training and growth. They've chosen Vanguard to, to invest their best time here, invest times into you, and it's our pleasure and our privilege to also invest in them. We're blessed to have them, and I believe they're blessed to be here. I really do. I believe they're going to be better for it. Um, and so as I've talked about leadership and that it's part of your job to ensure a healthy leadership, you also have a responsibility toward our leaders. You're to honor them, and that means with respect, appreciation, with support. Um, and, as and we're also concerned that they would be able to, to, meet, to have their needs met as far as possible. So I want to present them to you. First of all, uh, Vincent Hunter, where is he? Is he? Come on out, Vincent. I'm going to ask them to come so you can see them both online and in person. You'll be able to see them. Now, Vincent Hunter, you know, is our youth director. Very excited um, about bringing him on. I'm excited about all of our, our leaders, but yeah, you could just, you know, um, yeah, that's perfect. And can you, I don't know if we can just maybe move the, the camera so that they can s make sure that everybody can be seen. Awesome. All right. So, Vincent, I want to thank you, and I want to affirm you that we're going to support you. And we look forward also to your ministry among us and uh, helping with, with our youth and also other areas. All right. Secondly, I want to ask Josh and Katie Vanzenbeek to, to come up. Yeah, I'll give them a hand. <laughs> All right. They are our young adult leaders. They are being brought on. Actually, we're forming and establishing a young adult group, and I praise the Lord that God's put it on their heart to come and intern, and they're also going to be looking, how do, how do you run a church? How do you, as it talks about here, how do you rule over and um, righteously even over God's church? Because they have it in their heart to lead a rural church, and so I think this is a great place for them to learn and grow, and so thank you for for coming, and uh, I also know we'll, we're going to be a blessing to you as well. All right, so, um, I guess fourthly, we have Andrew Barb. Now he's, come on up, Andrew. Now give him, give him a hand, yeah. Now you may have seen him around as well, and he's going to be helping out. He has, a, he has a real passion and love for God's Word, and so in my class, not all of them do, I, by the way, but just to, to note that, but I, in pr he's, he loves to study and do exegesis and that sort of thing, and uh, so we want to help him in terms of growing that, and we saw him interact with youth also this past Friday at our youth gathering at our house, and uh, he, just, he just loves the youth, and it's so good, so good to see. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we want to be a blessing to you as well. Um, Carrie Le Lehman, come on up. Now, her full name is... Her full name is Carrie Ann, but she likes to go by Carrie. She is going to be helping, likely, with children's uh, ministry as well. Um, and she is also now, um, now I'm just they are engaged, correct? Okay, I want to make sure. So <laughs> these two are married. I think that's known by their last name. Um, and these two are uh, engaged to be married next year. They've asked us actually to do their, to perform their wedding in Ontario. Never been there even. So uh, we were honored and blessed. So uh, we're looking forward to that. I know th this year will speed by, I'm sure, like just a few days. But uh, anyway, we're blessed to have them. And Carrie is going to be doing her, her practicum also with us. All right. And lastly, our sixth Vanguard student is Chris Fleming. Come on up, Chris. Now, Chris also has expressed a love and desire to work with kids, and so we're going to give him that opportunity. Um, so thank you, Chris. Uh, and so make sure you, you make efforts to get to know them um, and to, you know, to introduce yourself and welcome them. Uh, it's, you know, it's, I believe we're, that's one of the, really, the great things that we do well is welcome and love uh, love people into our into our family. So I want to thank you all. Now, just one other note. This is not all of our leaders. These are Vanguard's college students. Um, and 
up until this up until this year, I think we might have had two at one point, Vanguard College students. So this is an incredible blessing, and I really see it as an over, like just overflowing um, that God has blessed us in this season. And so I know God is going to do great things. Um, but we do, I wouldn't want to, you know, we have many leaders, many of you have, sh- ha- have um, stepped up to lead and guide and um, in our church. And just so you know, we honor you as well. Um, and uh, it just really is a blessing. All right, let's give them all one h- big hand. And <laughs> Thank you, guys. You can, you can have a seat, and I, I'm, I'm just going to pray. Because it, we're getting a little late here, I'm just going to pray, and then I'm going to release you. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that, first of all, you are the leader of leaders. You are perfect in all of your ways. And we, even as we sung, we have value because you love us. You are great. You are perfect. And so, Lord, we thank you for choosing us, making us part of your family, for sending Jesus, our King and our Lord. Lord, I pray for us as an assembly, first of all, that, Lord, we would set our faces to follow you, Jesus, that we would not go to the right or to the left, But then also we would honor the leadership that is among us. Honor, respect, support. And even as we've been talking about today, that, Lord, even as we know there will be a blessing to us, let us be a blessing to them. Um, Lord, help us to have healthy leaders, to be a healthy church. Let us reaffirm and commit ourselves to loving you and loving your people. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. It's been a great time in, in God's presence. Just one reminder, so it, um, no one forgets, there is a, uh, a Kingdom Kids leadership meeting. So if you're a junior leader, a leader, um, or part of their family, okay, you are welcome to jo- and I mean physical family this time. You're welcome to join us for, for lunch. We're going to have a good time. God bless you. Go in God's grace.